In my previous videos, we spent quite a lot of energy looking at sine waves. We've seen how sine waves can propagate through circuits. We've used RMS voltages, currents in order to find powers. But what do you do when you have something that's AC but non-sinusoidal in a circuit? What do you do if you have a source that's a sawtooth wave or a triangular wave or a square wave? Can you still use RMS voltages and currents, for example, in order to calculate powers? Can you still use superposition? These are things that we're going to look at in this video. In order to set the stage for circuits where the sources are not sinusoidal, Let's first take a look at an example where the source is sinusoidal and otherwise simple just to review some concepts. Here we're tasked with finding the average power consumed in a 100 ohm load resistor at two different frequencies. We can solve this problem using phasors and voltage division. My goal here is to find the RMS voltage across the load resistor because once I know the RMS voltage, I can very easily find the average power. Let's multiply the numerator and the denominator here by the complex conjugate of the denominator in order to get the imaginary part into the numerator. The inductance L is given in the problem, so the phasor form of the load voltage is a function only of the frequency omega. In part A, the frequency is 100 Hz, so we have enough information to find the load voltage both in Cartesian form and in polar form. The amplitude of the load voltage can be used to find the RMS voltage, which then can give us the average power. In part B, the frequency is now 1 kilohertz, so we just need to recalculate omega in order to find the new load voltage, both in Cartesian and polar form. We can immediately notice that the frequency doesn't matter when you're calculating power. That's why using RMS is so useful. But that only works with sine waves. Let me show you why. We're going to first take a look back at the meaning, the mathematical meaning that is, of RMS. Here we have an arbitrary waveform plotted. In this case it's a sine wave. But we're going to find the RMS voltage, not by using the formula that we already know, by dividing the amplitude by the square root of 2, but instead by using the formula for RMS voltage. RMS stands for root mean square, so let's do exactly that with this particular waveform. We're going to square the waveform and then take the square root over one period. There's the root, there's the mean, and there's the square. We have here a plot of voltage versus time, so we should have all the information we need here in order to find the RMS voltage. Let's go ahead and do it. Calling the period tau, we know that frequency is the inverse of the period. The angular frequency is 2 pi times the frequency. If we call the amplitude of this sine wave V sub m, then we can write V of t as Vm times sine omega t. Let's substitute this into our equation for the RMS voltage. It's not too much effort to look up that integral, and it turns out that evaluating sine of 2 omega t at both endpoints gives you zero. We've recovered the formula that we're already familiar with. That is, the RMS voltage of a sinusoid is just the amplitude divided by the square root of 2. For the sine wave shown, the RMS voltage is just 1 divided by the square root of 2. Now that we've reviewed how to calculate the form of the RMS voltage for a sine wave, let's use that same integral definition for the RMS voltage in order to do the same thing with a square wave. Then we'll see if it's any use for us when we're actually solving circuits. Let's find the RMS voltage of this square wave. We'll start off with the same formula for the RMS voltage, which comes from the definition of RMS. The voltage here has a piecewise definition, so it makes sense to split the integral into two different pieces. For times between 0 and a half period, the voltage is just 10. Therefore, the voltage squared is 100. For the other half period, the voltage is minus 10. Therefore, the voltage squared is also 100. The integral of 100 is 100t, and we need to evaluate that between 0 and 0 0.5 tau. We get something very similar for the other integral here as well. The period cancels out of this equation underneath the square root sign, finally giving us 10 for the RMS voltage. It turns out in this case that the RMS voltage is equal to the amplitude of the square wave. If it had been a sine wave, we would have had to divide it by the square root of 2. So you can see that voltages with different waves have different formulas for finding the RMS voltage. Let's now look at a circuit with a square wave and see if this RMS voltage is of any use to us. We're first going to look at a circuit that has only a resistor. Let's assume that the source is just the square wave that we've already plotted here on the left. Furthermore, let's say that I want to find the average power consumed in this load resistor. 
Normally, that is, if the source were sinusoidal, we would be able to write that the average power is the square of the RMS voltage divided by the resistance. Does that formula work here, though, since the source has a square wave? In order to find the answer, let's first calculate the instantaneous power and then average it over one period. We'll see if we get the same result that this formula would give us. Since the circuit is very simple here, I know that the voltage across the resistor is just equal to the voltage across the source. Therefore, the instantaneous power is the square of our source voltage divided by the resistance. If I look over here at our graph, I can see that the square of the source voltage is actually constant. It's just 100 volts squared all the time. During the first half cycle, when the voltage is 10, squaring it gives us 100. And during the second half of the cycle, when the voltage is negative 10, squaring it also gives us 100. Since it's constant, I know that the average over one period, or the average overall time here, is also just 100. Therefore, the average power and the instantaneous power burned up in this resistor happen to be equal. This resistor consumes one watt. If we take our RMS voltage, which was 10, and divide it by the load resistance, which is 100, I also get one watt. We can conclude that using the RMS voltage for this particular simple circuit happened to give us the correct answer for the power consumed in that resistor. But does the formula still work when we have a more complicated circuit? What happens, for example, if I insert an inductor between that source and the resistor? Let's take a look at that circuit and see what might happen. I've decided to put a 16 millihenry between that square wave source and the load resistor. Will the resistor still consume one watt or will it consume some other power? That's what we're going to find out here. The question that I just asked is related to the following very similar question. Is the shape of the wave that shows up across the load resistor still a square wave or is it some other kind of wave? If it's not a square wave, then the method of using the RMS voltage that I just pointed out is not going to work because we wouldn't know what the form is for the RMS voltage. What we know for sure in this circuit, or in any circuit really, is that if it's a sinusoidal source, then we can use RMS voltages and currents in order to find power. There's something called a Fourier series that you might be familiar with. The way we're going to tackle this problem is to decompose the square wave into a Fourier series. Any periodic signal, no matter how complicated, can be represented as an infinite sum of sinusoids with different component values. We're going to use the decomposition here in order to solve this circuit over and over again for each of the component sinusoids. First of all, let's take a look at the form for a square wave if I write it as a Fourier series. What this formula tells us is that we can represent this particular square wave as an infinite sum of sinusoids of various frequencies and amplitudes. I'm not going to derive in this video why this particular Fourier series represents a square wave, but I'm going to prove to you that this particular representation is correct. I'm going to do it by truncating the series. We're first going to look at just one sinusoid, the n equals 1 case. Then we're going to look at the n equals 1 plus n equals 3 values, the first two terms in this series. Then we're going to add up the first three, and so on and so forth. If we set n equals to 1 and we don't include any other terms in the sum here, then we end up with just a single sine wave. What if I go to 3 instead? What's it going to look like? This is the sum of two different sinusoids. What if I stop at 5, 7, 9, 21, 51, or 501? As you can see, the more terms that I include here in the summation, in other words, the more terms I include before truncating the series, the closer the wave we get matches the actual square wave that I'm trying to represent here by the Fourier series. Hopefully this has shown to you that, indeed, this particular representation of the square wave is correct. Now how are we going to use this in order to make some headway in finding the power burned up in that resistor? The strategy that we're going to use is superposition. Whereas in the original circuit, I have a single square wave source, in my equivalent circuit that I'm now drawing, I'm going to write a large number of sinusoidal sources. I'm going to put all of these sources in series with one another. There's the n equals 1 source, there's the voltage on it, there's the n equals 3 source, and using the formula, here's the voltage on it. 
Since these sources are all in series with one another, they add up and just give us our original square wave source. We have only a small problem here to deal with, and the problem lies in the inductor. The inductor contains an omega. You might think, well, that's very easy, omega is just 2 pi f. But this omega always refers to the frequency of the source. Look back at our sources, though. Each of these sources has a different omega. The first source has an omega of 2 pi f. We could call that omega sub 1. But this source, our second source, has a different omega. We could call this omega sub 3, but that's 6 pi f, whereas omega 1 was just 2 pi f. Since the omega is different, it means that the impedance of the inductor is going to be different for each source. How are we going to get around this problem? Well, what we're going to do is calculate the voltage across the load resistor for each source independently, changing the impedance of the inductor in each case. Then we'll add up all of the contributions using superposition. It's a complicated process, but I hope you can see that it's definitely going to give us the correct answer because these are all linear circuit elements. To summarize, our strategy will be to zero out all of the sources except for the n equals 1 source, and then we will find the voltage across the load due to that source. Then we'll zero out all of the sources except for the n equals 3 source. We'll then find the voltage across the load due to the n equals 3 source. We'll do this for a large number of sources. Finally, we'll use superposition in order to calculate the true voltage across the load resistor. After I know the true voltage across the load resistor, I can see if it's a square wave or not by graphing it. Since I know the load voltage as a function of time, I can just square it and divide it by the resistance in order to calculate the instantaneous power. And if we know the instantaneous power, then we can integrate over a period and divide by a period in order to find the average power. In order to get a handle on this somewhat complicated process, we'll start with the n equals 1 source. I've zeroed out all of the other sources in this infinite series. Since this source is sinusoidal, I can use phasors in order to find the voltage across the load here. I'm going to use voltage division here, which is the same method we used earlier before we looked at square waves. The only thing that we need to be careful of when we change the n is just to note that our amplitude is going to change and our omega might also change as well. After substituting in for both omega and our inductance L, I see that the phasor form of the load voltage is a complex number, nothing more. We can write this complex number in both rectangular and polar form. Now that I know the phasor form, I can go back and write the time domain form of the voltage across the load resistor due to the n equals 1 source. Let's take a look at a plot of the voltage across the load due to the n equals 1 source. Here's what it looks like. It's just a sine wave. If I find the average power burned up in the load resistor by integrating this curve over one period, I would find that the average power is 0.8 watts. This is just one sine wave though, and I know that this is not the real voltage across the load. Now that we found the voltage due to the first source, let's calculate the voltage due to the second source, or the n equals 3 source. Compared to the n equals 1 source, I can see that the amplitude is different and the frequency is also different. Other than that, I can use the same method to solve the problem, voltage division. After substituting in for my frequency omega and my inductance L, I find that the phasor form of the load voltage due to the n equals 3 source it's just a complex number. Let's write it again in Cartesian and polar form. Now that I have the phasor form of my load voltage due to the n equals 3 source, I can write the time domain form of this voltage. I've gone through two sources now. In order to perfectly represent the square wave, I would have to add up an infinite number of sources. That would be very difficult to do. But thankfully, we can truncate the series. As long as we include enough of these sources such that the power through that load resistor starts to converge to whatever accuracy we might desire, it ends up not being a terrible amount of work if you have a computer to help you. Let's go ahead and plot what the voltage across the load resistor would look like if we include only the first two terms in this infinite series. Our voltage across the load now has a more complicated formula. The average power across the load is now 0.88 watts. 
Let's see what happens to this average power as I include more and more terms from the infinite series. Let's also see how the voltage changes. Here's what it looks like with three terms, with eight terms, with 12 terms, with 17 terms, 27 terms, and 252 terms. As you might recall, superposition cannot be used to calculate average power. So in order to find the average power shown here on the view graph, 0.936 watts, I've used the formula shown and integrated over a full period of the voltage across the load in the time domain. That voltage is given by the very long formula here shown on the left side of the view graph. Obviously, I've used a computer to do it. What I'd like you to notice about the graph of that voltage, though, which is shown here in the sensor, the voltage versus time across the load, is that this voltage is clearly not sinusoidal on its own, and it's also not a square wave. Because it's neither a sine wave nor a square wave, it means that the RMS voltage of the source is useless when trying to find the RMS voltage across the load here. We've used a rather complicated method in order to find this graph, but I hope that you would agree that although it's complicated, it makes a whole lot of sense. Because time domain signals can be always decomposed into a Fourier series, we now have a general method that can be used to analyze any time domain signals. The method that I've just demonstrated is quite involved, but there does exist a method called the Fourier transform method, which allows analysis of these signals with a little bit less mathematical overhead. What I'd like to do now is to go over to the bench and put together this circuit that we originally sought to look at. We're going to see if the load voltage actually matches the graph that we've just derived. I've got the circuit built here on the bench, the function generator is set to a frequency of 100 Hz to match what the circuit diagram has called for. For the moment, we have the oscilloscope monitoring the source voltage. As you can see, we have a square wave here on the screen. What I'm going to do now is to move channel 1 here of the oscilloscope over to our load resistor. Let's see what that waveform looks like. I think that what the oscilloscope shows here on the screen very closely matches what we derived over the tablet computer. As you can see, it's clearly not a square wave. This video is part of an organized sequence where I explore various AC and switching circuits. If you enjoyed it, then you might consider following the channel's playlist to learn more about these types of circuits.